What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of A Thinking Man's Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Joseph Percher. With me, as always, my good friend Tommy Styles. Tommy, what's up, buddy? How are you? Good, man. It's a leg day. It's sunny. It's beautiful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I figured it must have been nice out. You got the you got the the guns out. Um, not so nice out here. I got I'm dealing with a little bit of a sickness again, man. I've been sick more in the last three months than I've been in the past fucking three years combined, probably. Um, so we're going to talk about breaking through strength and size plateaus in general um, and different things that we've done, whether it's changing the train, the training protocol or uh, changing the training approach, changing the PED protocol, um, what we might do with food or other aspects of the lifestyle that we look at. So um, kind of a general topic, but where do you want to start with this? So talking about breaking through both strength and like kind of weight gain, size gain plateaus, What's a what's been a go to for you? What are some strategies that you use? I mean, bump the drugs, right? Now that that is a, a method, but it works. We'll kind of run through it more systematically before that. Um, I look at what I'm doing with rep. That's why I think it's so important to train in a variety of rep ranges because maybe I'm stuck on one set of rep range, a rep range as far, but my so maybe I'm stuck on the lower end of say five to seven reps, but my 10 to 12 rep range for that same exercise does keep making small improvements. Um, I may structure it to where I can, I might pull that top or that high rep set if it's before the heavy set as a way to conserve energy to maybe bust through a plateau. Mm. Um it may just be depending on where that exercise is in the rotation. If it's like third or second, I may move it to first as a means to bust through plateau. Um, typically, I think strength plateaus, the biggest thing you have to look at is, is it a mental block? Um, and if I plateau on a single movement, you know, two, three, four times in a row, to me, it's just, it's become like an obsessive or a compulsive obsession with that movement. And I just need to get away from it for maybe a session or two and then come back to it. And then I'm like clear headed and I can go through it. Um, if if diet changes are warranted, then that, that's an option. Um, there's no one thing I've done that I, that I can say always works. Um, on the topic of drugs, I think, you know, if I'm taking an oral, I can, that's pretty much a plateau buster, whether it be Anavar, D ball, T ball. If I'm taking that, like I can find strength. Um, also, I think I, to jog back to mentality, I think I have the ability to really flip a switch and go to a very dark place in my head for training. I don't do that as much currently where I'm at in life and how long I've been bodybuilding because I don't find I find it actually taps into my dopamine too much and I can't get out of that state when it's time to like push my cat or push my food so I try to be a lot more calm going into a working set than I used to I used to get internally like revved up like a, like an engine and just really get almost psychotic before the set and I found that I was actually taking away from my performance by doing that so, but what that is mean, in that, in that one set, you feel like it's less or, or the ensuing workout is diminished. The ensuing workout and in the set, I mean, all of that energy built going into it may take a rep or two away because I'm just like petering out. Mm. Um, whereas if you go into it almost calmer, knowing what you're capable of doing, it becomes your calmness becomes a skill. Yeah. Um, and, I don't have it. In that aspect, you're almost, I almost think about it because I've gone through the same progression where I used to just be a maniac going into my main sets. Uh, but it's, it's more, you almost, I feel like I almost matter of factly go about my sets now. Like this is this top set that I need to do. This is the, either the load or the reps that I need to do in order to make progress. And I'm just going to do it. And then I'm going to move on. Like it's, almost uh it's almost like matter of fact or just business like 
and I, I, I would agree with you that um, you don't tap into like your whole just recovery budget as much mm -hmm. trying to know about things like that. I think, uh, I, I mean, I give credit to Andrew Huberman and his podcast for all the stuff I've learned about dopamine, especially recently. Like, yeah, he's really kind of opened my eyes and made me, I can uh, relate what he talks about as far as dopamine to what we do with bodybuilding. So yeah. I've really audited how I go about even, even the music I choose sometimes, like I don't want to get too, too far stimulated. Yeah. Um, I need to keep that everything harnessed and release it at the right time and then pull it back in so I can get through the whole session. Whereas when I was younger, it was just like, I could run through a wall, but once I get through the wall, I'm done. Mm. Um, now what's so, uh, you were saying, like, save it for the right time. What's the right time for you just, and within your training? What's, when are you just kind of letting it rip? If it's, if there's a movement I've become fixated on, we're like, okay, I've, I've squeaked out one rep progressions week after week, or a, a certain weight has got me a couple of times. And I'll look back in my log books. I'll look back. I'll, I'll kind of have done my research and been like, all right, you know, three plates and a quarter on the Smith machine incline on the low incline has been my, the bane of my existence. I don't know why, like, I've tried two and a half. So I've tried like, this is all an example, but, and then I've, I've created this challenge, but it's a small goal now because I think taking small goals and small wins helps you stay in an off season long. Like yeah, I have no issue being in off season for years because I've been, I've taken training performance so serious down to where I've like done my research on myself, my anecdotal feedback to see like, okay, this movement um, a lot of stuff with legs too. Like I got stuck on hack squats, leg press, pendulum, Smith machine squats. So those, when I find a sticking point, it's because it's been building for weeks or months even, or even years if I've rotated movements and then it's just about beating it. Yeah. Uh, I think the rep range thing is a, is a good one to talk about, um, I think even something as simple as just changing, because uh, like we could talk about rep range, we could talk about the order of the exercises, where it fits within the training plan itself. Um, but I think just rep range alone for before you talk about ad adjusting anything, um, you can you can get more runway out of the same exercise just by changing what your target is. If you've been in a you know in a mode of targeting like five to seven and you just have stalled and you just keep hitting the same weight for the same seven four weeks in a row mm -hmm. um, i think just shooting for higher reps then at that point just doing what you're not doing if it's the other way around and you're targeting 14s and 15s and all of a sudden you just can't hit them anymore yeah then maybe you bring it down to five to sevens or eights and look to get strong and and you're kind of just resetting your map then and resetting the type of runway that you have on it um so i think just challenging finding a new challenge even if it's the same movement the same exercise order just with a different rep range i think could go a long way um in terms of how much runway you have with that exercise and within those parameters um and then also, I think the the big one that I took from what you said is like the priority within the exercises. Like if you are really needing to, you know, you really want to bring up your hack squat because your quads are such a priority to you. Um, you probably want to do it pretty early on in the session then before you get into fatiguing yourself with all this other stuff. Um you know, like if your hamstrings are really good and your quads really need to come up, I probably wouldn't do an RDL and a bunch of hamstring work before hack squatting. So I think that's a big one. I think just in general, I find over and over again, I'm so surprised by how often people just have no clue what their physique needs or what the weaknesses within their physique are. Most people that are pretty advanced or have been competing for a long time, I think we know better than anybody what it needs to improve on our physique. But mm -hmm. the people that are beginner to intermediate, man, they just really have no clue. And then 
that carries over to the way that their training is programmed. Like if you don't know what your priorities are, your training is going to reflect that. And it's, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So um, I think the two things there, I think rep ranges without changing anything else. And then um, changing, changing the priority in which you hit that movement. I think moving uh, like, even if you're targeting, let's say set five, you know, five to eights, in a hack squat and you're doing it third right now, you're doing it third or fourth in your rotation, um, moving it up to first or second, leaving this target rep range the same, um, still trying to hit those five to eights or whatever it might be. And then you move it up in the workout, you're going to be stronger and you're going to break whatever that plateau is. And then maybe you spend a, a training block with it in that new spot and then go back with the newfound strength and move it back later in the workout. There's a lot of things that you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you have, you have options, you have tools in the toolbox to kind of deploy to make training performance, the large brunt of your focus. I think with the younger people, it is tough to know, like, what do I need when you see yourself? Because to you, if you have any sort of like of a humble out and respect for what bodybuilding is, you, you know, that you, everything sucks and it needs to get better. I mean, I still look at myself like that. So yeah, for that, I think it is okay to focus on just total strength. And if more often than not, with my younger people that just need size, if they run into a move, I tell them like, you know, if you if you stall three times in a row on a movement and there's no progression, tell me we'll just chuck it and we'll put something else in and we'll. You have so much to add. It doesn't. You don't need to get stuck on one movement because you're still in that incipient phase where we just need to get stronger with proper form with all body parts, no matter what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think higher frequency with a lower volume is, is the way to go for most of those people with the brunt focus while using all rep ranges, just being on total strength. Um, that's kind of how I program both for men and women when it comes to that, like there may be certain needs for a division. So, you know, bikini and wellness are training legs three times a week and upper body maybe once, but the over the overarching theme is like, we need to get strong with proper form but also this is where it gets gray is like i it depends on the client of whether i would like have them do certain sets that may be like touch new weights i think it's been called on instagram and i've said it before too um as a way of like priming yourself i've done it with uh i remember doing it in 2020 with dead stop barbell rows I was comfortably getting 365 for like eight off the floor and I would like jump up to 385 or 405 even for a set of like three just to feel it and yeah. then try to add a couple reps to it the next time I did it a rep or two um now you have to watch overall recovery and Obviously, don't let form. You're trying to improve form too. The first time you bust through strength, the form's probably not going to be the best it can be, and that's why you get to that that new stimulus, that new level on the mountain, and then you spend time there cleaning it up. I think the issue that the logbook presents, and I I ran into this doing DC, is you start to chase numbers rather than actually chasing progression, and because I learned the hard way, I can, I can see it when my clients are doing that. I'm like, you know, you're not going to be adding after that newbie phase of like the first one to two years, you're not adding 50 to hundred pounds to exercises throughout the year. Like it's a lot smaller of a micro progression when it comes to the load. So even on a week to week basis, I see so many people that like send training videos, um, you know, fucking leg press four plates aside or whatever. And then the next week they're sending it with five plates aside. And it's like, okay, like if you're able to do this, last week's workout was shit then. Um, or you're taxing yourself. Like you're not adding a plate every time. Like I think about it in terms of what am I adding this week that I can add for the next six weeks every week and, and hit it. Um, mm -hmm. So like you were saying, like chasing numbers, like I think people get to go too far with what they're adding. And and people just generally, I, I have found,
people struggle kind of choosing what their progressions are going to be in the gym. Um, like if you're using a big, you know, double-sided uh, movement, like whether that's like a, like a leg press that's loaded on both sides or a barbell that's loaded on both sides, like a two and a half or a five pound plate on each side week over week is more than enough to make crazy progress. Um, and then you also have to think about too, like, on some of these smaller movements, like a dumbbell curl, a dumbbell lateral, you're not adding load every time. It, it, it would be impossible to try to add five pounds. If those are the increments that your gym has in terms of dumbbells, you're not just going to be able to go up five pounds every week. That's a crazy percentage increase week over week. Like just going from 20 to 25 pound dumbbells, it's, it only seems like it's five pounds, which it is, but also that's a 25 pound increase. If we were talking about doing that on a bench press or, you know, a barbell row, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to do that week over week. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of taking progressions, that's something that people need to, to realize, but in terms of like just chasing load, that is a big time, uh, a big time mistake that I think people make is just saying, fuck it. As long as this weight moves, and I get this for eight after last week, I did it for seven. Like that's, I'm just putting that I did eight in the log book and then that's progress. And then next week I'm going to try and get nine. And it's like, man, you're probably not even actually making any progressive stimulus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's where having a coach to herd you in like, and, and re real rein you in, I should say is paramount because you know, I, I, I learned the wrong way or not the wrong way. I had to learn the hard way. And that put me in a position to be able to set up a system with clients. Like, all right, pump me training videos every week. And I just last week, I had a client who was, we need to bring up her back. And <clears throat> she's been sending me back videos every week. And my response has been, you need to lower the load. You're not, you're not pulling, you're just moving the weight. the back isn't even a factor right now. So in her update form, yesterday she says she feel like she's losing strength and then i had to remind her like you're not losing strength you're targeting the working muscle more so the strength you do have is more efficient so in a way there's less load on the bar there's less numbers in the logbook but at the same time the efficiency of the movements is better your training videos are 10 times better than they were three weeks ago and that over the course of the next 18 weeks or whatever we have left in the off season will yield a better physique. So sometimes it's just about zooming out from, I need to get from, you know, 275 to 315, no matter what. If that, if that's, I mean, I can, you know, take some smelling salts, hit it, put on some emotional music, and I can find a way to move something X amount of times, no matter what. But if we're still focused on bodybuilding and bringing up the physique, and you made a good point about the smaller movements. Like if on a chest day, I have my big movements, like an incline Smith press and a, a decline hammer strength or, and then at the end of the workout, I have the pec deck. I honestly don't care if the pec deck ever adds load because it's fourth in the rotation. It's not building me a big chest. It's more of just a movement, a fixed movement at the end of the session to finish my chest off and put a, put as much blood and get a good stretch. That movement can stay the same load for two months. Honestly, I don't care. I'd rather take a volume progression rather than add more load and just put more strain on my bicep tendons and my pecs. Um, just and that, that can be said about any small movement when it comes to uh, any body part, leg extension, some of these one arm lat focus movements we're doing, like you're not gonna get crazy strong at something so specific. Right. And something like single joint, it's an isolation movement. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a numbered progression in terms of how much load there is on smaller movements like that. I even think about uh, progressions in terms of like technique or tempo. Like if uh -huh. week I'm using the same load and like each time on a pec deck, for example, I sit and uh, like pause in the stretch each week that stretch gets longer and I just feel my chest more and more that's progress. Um, mm -hmm. But that's also, those are also good examples. Those movements are good examples 
of not just blindly chasing the numbers. Like those isolations that you do, especially near the end of a session, should be the movements that you feel, quote unquote, more than others. You're chasing the stimulus. Yeah. And like you said, you can you can move that stimulus up with volume. You can move it up, um, you know, even just with more reps with the same load. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't always need to be like blind chasing numbers. But going back to the to the original idea of like what are we doing um, when there's like clear training plateaus? You know, I know that we talk about it, and then sometimes we vilify it and, and say that it's weak or whatever the case is. I think depending on who it is, if it's if it's an advanced trainee and they are stuck like multiple weeks in a row on a movement or just in general, like multiple movements, you are probably talking about it a time where we might need to pull back for like a D volume week, a D load week, whatever you want to call it. Like if you've had training performance stall, like multiple days out of the week, multiple weeks in a row you're probably just smashing your head into the into the wall and it you'd be amazed like when you pull back for an advanced person that truly needs a timed d volume or d load week they it's almost without fail when they come back to the gym full force they are almost always reporting that they're like amazed at how much stronger they are how much more excited they are to train um how they just busted through all these different plateaus that they were at prior in the training so um again it's simple it sounds simple and it sounds like it's self-serving but that's a great example of why you do need a coach it's very difficult to look at all these things on your own objectively and realize okay this is everything that's at play my sleep was shit for you know for a week i'm seven weeks into a very difficult training block where progress has happened every time i'm in the gym up until now um it could just be one of those examples where you take a step back and then it propels you a couple steps forward. Uh, if you're not someone that's advanced and like hitting some of these big numbers like Tommy talked about, or, you know, five plus years into really seriously training for bodybuilding, then that's probably not you. You could probably just swap a movement out, move it around in the workout, try and hit a different, different rep range. There's all those different avenues for people that are not advanced that I would try to work through before um, dialing back on volume or, or training frequency, anything like that. Yeah, a lot of times just even one extra off day, like two off days in a row can be just what you need. Like you're hungry to get back in the gym, you get some extra food and extra rest. You even do something non bodybuilding related that takes your mind off of the log, the, the obsession. And yeah. I mean, I've used that multiple times. I'm like, man, I just, I'm going to take three days off, go back to the gym and soar. Yeah. Yeah. The three, I, I was going to say the same, the three days off or almost doing like, I will try to purposely almost train that for like a long weekend where I get everything in that I need to get in like Monday through Thursday and then take Friday, Saturday, Sunday off and come back fresh for Monday. For me, I'm one of those people that likes things to be set up like at the start of the week or like an uh, you know even kind of in a box start point or setup. Um, so that's a great time too. And that's that can carry over whether you are advanced or whether you are someone earlier in their journey. I think that those two or three day breaks have even more of an application than like a full week off or a full week of a deload or anything. Um, I think most people that really just enjoy this and want to do this, you're going to have a hard time trying to convince them to stay out of the gym for a week, which I think that's most of us. Um, but I, it does seem unless you're so buried and just for months or years on end, you've just not paid attention to any of your own biofeedback at all three days off in a row is probably going to be more than enough to like relight that fire for you. Now, whether or not it's enough to come back performance wise and beat something that you really struggled with, that will just depend on how buried you are, what the movement is, whatever the case is, whether it's been connective tissue problems that's been limiting you or any of this other stuff. Um, but I think that is like a way underused tool um, where people are, I don't want to say over obsessed, but like I've been in that mode where you're just so obsessed, even taking one day off feels like it's like 
how the, like I'm, I'm losing progress. Like, why would I, why would I ever do this? When you're in this for a long time, you start to realize what the big pillars are that really matter and need to be focused on and which ones you can kind of comfortably let go a little bit when the time calls for it. And I think like a long weekend off or like three or four days off is one of those examples. Yeah, I think once you've kind of honed in what the effort is you need to be giving to every training session and intensity is no longer a question mark, um, you know, a, a tool to deploy. Like you you bring that level of intensity and effort to training every session for fucking eight years. And it's like, OK, three days off from the gym is not going to negatively affect me. Even within your like you're given if you're finding a strength plateau is coming and you know what intensity is, then maybe restructuring the whole framework of your split and volume is needed to continue to bust or to bust through that strength plateau. If it's on a certain body part that you need to come up, maybe you need to take away volume from a body part that doesn't need to come up. Um, if it's overall strength fit or strength plateau for everything, then I would say all the volume needs to come down to a degree um, if rest isn't warranted. Like for me, I talked about what my, I'm on a four day split. I'm training four days a week off for three. I was previously training six out of every eight. My numbers that I was doing on very similar movements or all the same movements are going up simply because I'm not training six out of eight. I'm training four out of seven now and I get more rest. So that can be a move too. You may need to periodize your training and consolidate your training days. Um, lower your overall volume and increase your rest days. Like, I think we're not talking about that too. Yeah. I think one thing too, that does get maybe overlooked or under discussed is um, just like the mental excitement that you have about your training. Like you were saying, like there may come a time where things just need to change. If you've been, you know, we taught, we preach like patience and doing, doing the, playing the long game and doing the same stuff over and over again. But I've, I've had it myself where I'm eight months into the same split and pretty much the same programming. And at a certain point, like, unless, um, you know, unless like your priorities with your physique absolutely dictate that a split has to say a certain way, there's so much room for flexibility within training that, it should never be like a point of you being mentally stale in your training. Like there's plenty of stuff that you can change that sh mentally freshens you up and mentally excites you about the whole process to where I think that's something as a coach and as a bodybuilder, you should be mindful of like, am I mentally engaged in this plan? Like you should be, you should enjoy what, what you're doing in the gym. Like it should be something that you look forward to. Um, and if it's not, then I don't think it's, I don't think it's ridiculous to change things if like you're bored or, um, you know, and, and I don't say bored, like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be every three weeks things change, but like if you're months and months into a plan and like, you just can't turn it on the same mentally, then it, it's probably not a bad time to just change things. Yeah. And I think as a coach, you have to understand what type of client you have, like, yeah. I was thinking about that yesterday when I was training, I was like, man, I'm, I'm the most locked in when I've been doing the same movements for weeks. And I know like, it's almost like I have all these little superstitions with each movement locked down. So I play baseball, which is pure repetition. And that's what I've, that's what I love about bodybuilding is it's like, I ha even down to like the songs I choose and the, what I listen to on the drive to the gym, how long I sit in my car when I get to the gym, my, my warm up routine, like, everything is catered to what I'm doing. And when I start a new program, I don't have any of that mapped out. So I almost like, I don't like changing things unless I absolutely need to. But on the flip side, everybody isn't like that. So the psyche of your client, like maybe they can only squeeze eight to 10 weeks out of something. And they're like, they've just, you've lost them. It's like the tennis ball bounces and they're looking over there now. Like they don't, they don't, they don't operate like that. So I think it's important to not only one, understand yourself and be honest with yourself, but also, as if you're coaching others, you need to understand who you're working with and build something catered to that individual to where progression can still be achieved. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you have to know the psychology of your clients and pick up on the things that they are relaying to you. Like if it's, if it's not, 
if the things that they're pointing out are just mental, like, man, I am struggling to get up for the, for these sessions. I'm not enjoying these sessions. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to call an audible and, and change things. If it means that person continuing to enjoy the process, because I see a lot of people, I don't know if you've seen this with your coaching, but I see this and I don't know if this is just a me problem or the way that I do things or what. Um, but I just see a lot of people that are excited to, to sign up or excited to, um, you know, make a change or have a specific goal. Like they're like, Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm signing this, signing up. I want to get huge for a year. And then I want to prep for six months and get fucking crazy peeled. It's like, all right, awesome. Yeah, let's do this. I just have seen a lot of people that come in with that level of excitement and then not very long in they're burnt out. Like people say that they're done. Like, uh, you know, this is too much. I'm nowhere near giving a hundred percent to this. I need to quit or I need to pause coaching or whatever. Like my life is just in turmoil. I just can't believe how many, I, I'm just surprised by how many people I see that full on go from a hundred miles per hour excitement to not even a, a dulling of that, but just like a complete withdrawal of it where it's like hey i'm all in and i'm so excited about this pro this process and then three months in they're like man i'm just burnt out i don't know that this is for me i don't know if you've seen that but i have seen like a ton of people i almost wonder if there's so many people that are into the gym now and it's such a popular thing on social media and all this that if it it's just bringing people that are not really about this but they're like they want to try it or they or they think it's for them I, I do get that a lot. Um, I have a lot. Of, I mean, I've had a lot of people quit prep. Just yeah. we have a plan and I, I go through the same framework of how I would with anyone like you're this phase, this phase, this phase. And it's like not even eight weeks into prep. Sometimes it's see or they ghost or whatever. And it's like, all right, whatever. Like, um, I think there's levels to it. Um, I think definitely things are more popular. Like, I think back when I got into competing and it's like I saw a seasoned competitor at my gym and it, I wasn't in the online world deep enough to really even know what coaching was, but I just saw this dude and I had heard that he gets people ready for shows. And I was just like, I want to do that. Yeah. Um, and I've talked about this in other episodes, so I don't need to go deep into it, but it was just became a thing where I don't want to let this guy down. He's given me, you know, I'm doing something. I asked him to help me and I don't want to quit. So, um, but I do think, yeah, there's, there's a lack of passion. I think when you work with a coach who, you know, you and I are very prepared when it comes to like, okay, you want to do a show. Cool. We're going to do this, this, and this, and this all the way into the show. Like there's so many things that have to be online for that to work. And I think a lot of people just get like a reality check. Like, wow, this is, I thought it was just like, I get to go to the gym and eat some food. And then I get to get like, it's not like that. There's, it has to become your life in a sense. It does. Yeah. And I just think people, a lot of people aren't ready for that. Yeah. It's amazing to me too, how many people, not even, not even in contest prep, people, people will back out or quit just because of what it really, I, I, that's a great point. I don't think people really understand. Um, They're scared of the unknown. Well, that, and I don't think, I think people love the, the end result. People see people at their gym or online and they're like, holy shit, this guy looks really impressive. I want to look like that. And it's like, okay, maybe that, maybe you do want to look like that. A lot of us want to look like that, but you're missing the piece that you're not willing to do what is required to actually look like this. Mm. Um, I think people, there's a disconnect between people and the physiques that they see or aspire to look like versus the amount of work that they're willing to do, man. Like people don't realize these people that they view or deem impressive whether it's in their gym or online man like they are either so fucking genetically superior to you that you could never even dream of looking like them or they have put an incredible amount of work into looking like that for an unbelievable amount of time and like you're just not prepared to do that like you're just not willing to do that amount of work 
and it's the people that like even in off season just can't cut it um men are just people that are just not really not really cut out for this i would say like you're like this life is the same thing day after day like there isn't like you're not going to get a reward and and you know you don't get to have a cheat day on sunday because you did everything that you were supposed to all week or um you know oh it's wednesday is my sister's birthday and it's like okay like bring your food like it, you know you know you're yeah. not eating at the restaurant because it's it's wednesday and it's your sister's birthday like i don't think people realize that you really have to live this like this has to be the number one priority all the time and then everything every other aspect of your life falls in behind it like where do the other elements of your life fit into bodybuilding it's not it's not the other way around for people that are really successful at this like people want to talk about balance and um compromise and all this stuff but it's like you don't really hear and see people that are on the way up or building something that's really impressive or worth talking about you don't hear those people ever talking about balance the only people that talk about balance are either people that have not accomplished anything impressive themselves or already have and now are set in the lifestyle that they have and they can afford themselves balance because they've already done everything they want to do so if you're not at that point, like you need to work your ass off and put in an impressive amount of work if you want an impressive result. Yeah, I, th I just think there's levels. I mean, if if someone comes to me never having done a show and they say I want to do a show, like after the initial assessment, the questionnaire, the phone call, we talk, I'm going to put a plan and give you goals that are achievable because, yeah, the stage is over here, but you're over here and you're nowhere near there. Like we have to there's a set of skills you have to develop to get there. And this could be for people that have already done shows, too. They may have just fucked off, got on stage, looked like shit. And that's where they're at. You have to learn how to train X amount of days per week, giving your best effort. You have to learn how to track your training. So you have the feedback to this whole podcast has been about feedback on training. Um, you have to learn how to get a set number of meals in every single day, which means going to the grocery stores, prepping your food, being prepared. If you have to work a job Monday, through, like your, you have to fix the plan to your life. The coach provides the plan, but you make it work. Um, you have to be able to manage your time to get your cardio in, your step count in. You have to get the supplements that are required of you and stay up on getting them. I, ha I hate when people say, I ran out of this, I ran out of this. There's no excuse to run out of anything. Like if, if remembering is an issue, they do subs subscription service now where they deliver on the same day of every month. There are zero excuses to forget your supplements or to be up on them. Um, you have to learn all of these skills and deploy them and prove that you can continue to deploy them. And that's what's going to get you close to not only to the stage, but it's going to put you in a chance to be competitive. Um, and I just think you don't want to, you don't eat a whole steak in one bite. You eat it bite by bite. And if you learn these skills and you're patient with your expectation or results, but you're aggressive and you're within your pro, you should be aggressive towards the process. Like, how do I learn how to train better? What do I got to do? Send this coach videos that he said he'll take video. Okay. I'm sending him videos. I'm going to follow the people that are providing good content and, and learn as much as I can soak up everything. There's so many resources to be good now, which is the problem is there's an overabundance. So you got things coming from all different ways. But for the most part, I think anybody under that first five year, like you just need to get really good at the basics. I, I mean, Kobe Bryant talked about that. Like this year, I focused on how to dribble this. The next year I focused on how to pass. And he's like, I just became obsessive about getting good at the basics and bodybuilding is no different. You know, I'm, I've been, this year will be 20 years of training for me. And I'm still every session, I'm treating it like I'm still chasing the perfect form on every rep of every set to, to create the perfect workout. And I haven't got there yet. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm still chasing it. You never will. I heard exactly. that. That's the beauty of it. The carrot never, or the, the goalpost keeps moving. The one thing though, and this stood stood out to me, and I've been waiting.
for a chance to where it makes sense to bring this up on a podcast. But um, I watched this interview with Phil Heath. He was on Jay Cutler's podcast. We talked about it, I think. He mm -hmm. said something to me that stood out, though, so much because they wanted to talk about his genetics over and over. And, oh, you know, like if Jay is like giving him these backhanded compliments where he's like, well, you know, Phil, like, you know, you had the genetics like you didn't have to train like me and Ronnie, like you didn't have to kill yourself like me and Ronnie did. And uh, Phil had this response and he's like, you know, maybe I didn't have to I didn't have to train like you guys. Um, but what I did was I perfected everything that I did. So there's a lot of guys that train and lift weights like Shaq shoots free throws. He's like, I trained like I was Steph Curry shooting free throws. And it's like 98% of these reps are perfect. Uh -huh. Whereas there are guys that go in and 40% of their reps are perfect. Um, and I just thought it was such a, it was such an interesting comment to hear from somebody that was at such a high level because we haven't heard that from our champions. Everything from our champions has just been smash your head through a wall and train harder than everybody else, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a good message. I don't want people to not train hard, but it's like you were saying, it's more of like, it's an ongoing journey of trying to, now, I don't want to say be perfect because you're never going to be perfect. One workout is never going to be perfect. Your physique is never going to be perfect, whatever. Most sets are not even perfect. Um, but it's it just speaks to like this, like you said, there's levels and there's like a journey, a journey to it where there should be um, like a thoughtful improvement every time you step foot in the gym like every time you step foot in the gym there should be some type of thoughtful uh you know i said it before thoughtful improvement like there should be something that you mindfully are in there like hey i'm really in here to improve this and make this look much better um I, I think that would just, I think people mindlessly go into the gym and just move weight from A to B and they did their three sets of 12 and that's that. Like there needs to be more than you just mailing it in. Like if you want to look better than the majority of people, you can't just do what the majority of people do. Like, and, and like we were saying before, like bodybuilding, successful bodybuilding is a hundred little decisions and a hundred little actions that you make in the course of a day. Now do that every day for a month. Now do that every month for five years. Now you're talking about the actions that should lead to you looking better than the majority of people, because you just spent the last five years every day making these little decisions and making these little actions that have to happen for bodybuilding a priority and so now you get the respect that comes along with building a, a impressive physique. That's what it is though. Like I have people that um, struggle with eating off plan or, um, you know, struggle with adherence in any way or struggle with burnout on the process. And it's like, this is very simple. Like every little decision that you make today is going to affect whether or not you ever achieve this goal, the timeline in which that you achieve your goal. Like it's just a hundred little decision. Every little decision that you make every day can really be boiled down to whether or not this makes me a better bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the choices you make either help you or hurt you. And yeah. you don't get the pity party or the, or the, or to feel guilt. I think when, once you learn that it's, it becomes a skill. It's like, it's easy to say no to food or alcohol. Oh, or no, easy. It's easy to say no to social interactions. Like, yeah. Oh, what time am I going to be back? Nope. Can't, I can't go out. I got to train yeah. in the morning or, yeah. um, you know, your wedding is when oh, I'm three weeks out. Sorry. I won't be there. Like that yeah. bodybuilding is very selfish. And, and you know, I've, the more I've leaned yes, into the, people are so selfish. the people that are best at it, learn to set like, we have such a problem in this in this society and this current day and age like it's such a big deal to be someone that sets boundaries like people think that you're rude or you're selfish or you're self-absorbed and all these things 
if you have developed the skill to set boundaries and just simply say no to people. I think saying no is a huge skill that the majority of people that I deal with in my day to day just simply do not have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to call me or you selfish from our outsider's perspective because of how callous our perspectives may be. Sure. But the whole basis of what we do for a living, yeah, we get paid for it. But I, I nothing but selflessness in my day to day. I'm constantly like if a client has a question, I answer. If they they need a you need your program changed, I change it. Uh, you know, this came up, blah, 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 blah. I, I get I snap in and I go to work. Like my selfishness leads to my ability to be selfless. Yeah. So, yeah. That reminds me, I uh, forget who one of these, one of these like uh big time speaker, influencer guys, military guy. It might have been might have been Jocko Willink or it might have been David Goggins. I forget who said it. Uh, but one of those guys has this quote where it's like discipline equals freedom. So it's like, it's like Jocko. so you so you tuck yourself into this little world of, of discipline where you make the same choices over and over and things are timed to a schedule and all these different things. And that sounds like to the outsider or to the person that has no discipline, that sounds like you might as well be in prison. That sounds like you're st stuck in your ways or whatever. Uh, but what people don't understand is that when you have that discipline and you've been 99% accurate with the things that you're supposed to be doing over a long haul, that then gives you the freedom, especially like, you know, depending on what your goals are or whatever, but like, um, you know, that gives you the freedom when you're on the money all the time, that gives you the freedom to take three days off when you're really beat up. And maybe that means you go out to dinner on Saturday night or whatever the case is, but um those the all those things have to come first like people talk about balance or freedom and all this stuff and it's like where is where is the desire to actually work hard and work after the stuff that you want to do like we're talking about like getting a reward or a break and all this stuff and it's like man you haven't even put in the beginner level of work before before asking for these things so um I think, I think people just, it comes down to like, there's like a level of stamina required to be a good bodybuilder because you need to be willing to be okay with just making these same boring choices day after day, month after month, year after year. There needs to be, that comes with a required level of mental stamina where you're just okay with doing that day after day. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've always rather than seeking balance, I think you should seek harmony. Mm. Harmony within all the decisions you make. Um, you, don't, you don't get to be like, you don't get you to- that, like, Harmony, like alignment, like everything's consistent. Yeah, like I can't be upset about a shitty workout if I made poor decisions beforehand that led to it being a shitty workout. And that's the case, you can apply that to anything. You know, lifestyle people, I see this time and time again, like, you know, Monday rolls around, they check in. Oh, I made some bad decisions this weekend. I'm really unhappy with what this check-in is. All right, rewind. You made those decisions though. So you can either sulk and feel sorry for yourself or you can use this as a learning experience. I don't want to feel like this again. So next weekend, I'm going to make better decisions. Boom, next Monday's check-in, I'm more excited. As a coach for years now, I've started to pick up on like, consistent traits of the people that are doing well whether it be lifestyle or competitor there if you did everything you're supposed to do and you gave it your best effort you're excited to check in you're not missing a check-in day if you did everything you're supposed to nobody that was 100 percent adherent is missing their fucking check-in i promise you that you're excited to send it it's like i did everything i'm supposed to do here you go dude tell yeah. me what you think here Give me the feedback. Yeah. That's like, I did all the homework, but I didn't turn it in. Like, no, yeah. you didn't do it. Yeah. Man, that's such a great way to put it. Cause I can remember times like being in school, like whether it was homework an assignment, a project, or even like another good example of that is like stud, like actually studying for a test. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not skipping school the day of a test that I studied my ass off for. Like that yeah. just didn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, I'm, that's a, that's a great point too. And especially I have Monday as a big check-in day and uh -huh. it's, man, you see it so often where people, 
you know, just self-sabotage or go nuts on the weekends. And it's like, Hey, you know, I'm going to be late with this check-in and can I check in Tuesday or Wednesday? Or, um, like you said, where people are like, man, I went off the rails and I didn't even, I didn't even take photos because I didn't like how I looked. And it's like, well, you don't like how you look because of the decisions that you made. Um, and it's the same thing on when you do nail it, you're like, man, I can't wait to take these photos and see what I look like because I nailed it. I nailed everything that I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think whether it be strength, like everything's mental, um, all of our rewards and our, um, our failings, it's all internally driven. Yeah. That's by our choices. So I think when you start to tap into that and you get really analytical of all your little micro choices that you make throughout the day, you know, it can either break you or it can make you. Um, I'm even in that phase right now, just like auditing my time management as I take on more clients, as I go into a prep, like I need to be on the ball about every single detail. And at times there's, if I fuck up, there's stress, but it's like, God damn it, Tommy. But also the challenge of getting everything right and making progress in small areas is what fuels me. That's my life purpose is to always progress. So, you know, what you said about being thoughtful of what did I, what did I improve on in the gym today? You know, I had a client who he fell way off because of some, um, some stomach stuff, some real digestive, some, some shit, some medical stuff. And we're just like baby steps coming back, like eating what he can, training what he, when he can, but not failing. Um, and I encouraged him to, at the end of every day, write down three things that he considers wins for the day, just to build forward momentum. Cause it's, it's hard to get momentum if you're, you've never been there. But what's even harder is if you've been up here and something in life knocks you way down here off the mountain and you got to climb back up because you know what it's like up there. And it may be, you know what you had to go through to get there. So that's just a little, anybody listening, that's a tool you can use. You know, I, I look at that as more of a self love. Like, what did I do right today? I'm going to focus on that. And then what did I do wrong? Where can I improve? But at the same time, like when you're, when you've hit a wall, like, and you, and you need anything and everything, like three little wins every night before you go to bed and then close your eyes. Like that's a tool because you're going to bed. Like I did three things, right. I'm going to wake up and do three more things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you were talking earlier about like that dopamine driving type behavior. And that's, that's part of it. Like when you start to feel like you have a system in place or you're doing things the way that you should, you're actually motivated to continue to do those things and, and seek those behaviors that give you that type of feeling. So yeah, that's all good stuff, man. I don't really have anything else. I know that we're closing in on an hour or two. So um, any final points that you wanted to touch on or any final takeaways? No, that turned mental and psychological real quick. I like it. That's, that's my bag. That's what I find you know, obviously you need to know your shit as a coach, but at the same time, like a lot of coaching and building rapport with clients is just developing that trust and that like bond. I mean, yeah. cause it's all other than maybe your local people that you might see at your gym, like it's all online. I've never met some of my clients. So yeah. most yeah. of them. So being able to like have these conversations and understand these types of things is what has allowed me to have some success with coaching and to have the confidence to coach anyone provided that they're willing to work hard. Uh, but you have to be willing to like look in at the ugly parts of yourself that are preventing you from getting to where you want to be. Yeah. And once you can do that, it's progression starts to roll a lot faster once you get out of your own way. Yeah. And then having like having a, the awareness, the self-awareness of what your downfalls are, is really the first step then then you're able like once you've identified them and you're like man i keep self-sabotaging or you know i have these patterns that continue to limit what my potential is that's when you can take action on removing them or changing them or whatever the case is but if you have no like if you have no self-awareness and you aren't able to identify these mistakes and you're just every week you're like yeah you know i just uh, binged all weekend. I don't know what the deal is. Like, I'm really bummed out about this check-in and it's like, well, okay. Like you've done this four weeks in a row now. Like when are we now? And we've talked about this. Like, when are we going to actually address this behavior? So, um, 
yeah, I think this was a good one. This was, um, I'm always, I always like hearing your thoughts on like mentality and mindset. And I think it's a, it's a good, uh, a good topic in general for most of our listeners slash clients. I know that we have a lot of clients that listen to this. So, uh, this was a good one, man. I think, I think there will be a lot of value for people to draw from this. So I think that's a, a good spot for us to wrap it and, uh, close it off right under an hour. So, um, for Tommy Styles, I'm Joseph Perchard. This was another episode of a Thinking Man's podcast. And until next time, guys, we are out.